Part 2 of Chapter 1 of The River War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The River War by Winston Churchill. Chapter 1, Part 2. Towards the end of 1879, Gordon left the Sudan. With short intervals, he had spent five busy years in its provinces. His energy had stirred the country. He had struck at the root of the slave trade, he had attacked the system of slavery, and, as slavery was the greatest institution in the land, he had undermined the whole social system. Indignation had stimulated his activity to an extraordinary degree. In a climate usually fatal to Europeans, he discharged the work of five officers. Careless of his methods, he bought slaves himself, drilled them, and with the soldiers thus formed, pounced on the caravans of the hunters. Traversing the country on a fleet dromedary, on which in a single year he is said to have covered 3,840 miles, he scattered justice and freedom among the astonished natives. He fed the infirm, protected the weak, executed the wicked. To some he gave actual help, to many freedom, to all new hopes and aspirations. Nor were the tribes ungrateful. The fiercest savages and cannibals respected the life of the strange white man. The women blessed him. He could ride unarmed and alone where a brigade of soldiers dared not venture. But he was, as he knew himself, the herald of the storm. Oppressed yet ferocious races had learned that they had rights. The misery of the Sudanese was lessened, but their knowledge had increased. The whole population was unsettled, and the wheels of change began slowly to revolve. Nor did they stop until they had accomplished an enormous revolution. The part played by the second force is more obscure. Few facts are so encouraging to the student of human development as the desire, which most men and all communities manifest at all times, to associate with their actions at least the appearance of moral right. However distorted may be their conceptions of virtue, however feeble their effort to attain even to their own ideals, it is a pleasing feature and a hopeful augury that they should wish to be justified. No community embarks on a great enterprise without fortifying itself with the belief that from some points of view its motives are lofty and disinterested. It is an involuntary tribute, the humble tribute of imperfect beings, to the eternal temples of truth and beauty. The sufferings of a people or a class may be intolerable, but before they will take up arms and risk their lives, some unselfish and impersonal spirit must animate them. In countries where there is education and mental activity or refinement, this high motive is found in the pride of glorious traditions or in a keen sympathy with surrounding misery. Ignorance deprives savage nations of such incentives. Yet in the marvelous economy of nature this very ignorance is a source of greater strength. It affords them the mighty stimulus of fanaticism. The French communists might plead that they upheld the rights of man. The desert tribes proclaimed that they fought for the glory of God. But although the force of fanatical passion is far greater than that exerted by any philosophical belief, its sanction is just the same. It gives men something which they think is sublime to fight for and this serves them as an excuse for wars which it is desirable to begin for totally different reasons. Fanaticism is not a cause of war. It is the means which helps savage peoples to fight. It is the spirit which enables them to combine, the great common object before which all personal or tribal disputes become insignificant. What the horn is to the rhinoceros, what the sting is to the wasp, the Mohammedan faith was to the Arabs of the Sudan a faculty of offense or defense. It was all this and no more. It was not the reason of the revolt. It strengthened, it characterized, but it did not cause. Quote, I do not believe that fanaticism exists as it used to do in the world, judging from what I have seen in this so-called fanatic land. It is far more a question of property and is more like communism under the flag of religion. End quote. From General Gordon's Journals at Khartoum, Book 1, page 13. Those whose practice it is, 
to regard their own nation as possessing a monopoly of virtue and common sense, are wont to ascribe every military enterprise of savage peoples to fanaticism. They calmly ignore obvious and legitimate motives. The most rational conduct is considered mad. It has therefore been freely stated, and to some extent believed, that the revolt in the Sudan was entirely religious. If the worst untruths are those that have some appearance of veracity, this impression must be very false indeed. It is perhaps an historical fact that the revolt of a large population has never been caused solely or even mainly by religious enthusiasm. The reasons which forced the peoples of the Sudan to revolt were as strong as the defense which their oppressors could offer was feeble. Looking at the question from a purely political standpoint, we may say that upon the whole there exists no record of a better case for rebellion than presented itself to the Sudanese. Their country was being ruined, their property was plundered, their women were ravished, their liberties were curtailed, even their lives were threatened. Aliens ruled the inhabitants, the few oppressed the many, brave men were harried by cowards, the weak compelled the strong. Here were sufficient reasons, since any armed movement against an established government can be justified only by success, strength is an important revolutionary virtue. It was a virtue that the Arabs might boast. They were indeed far stronger than they, their persecutors, or the outside world had yet learned. All were soon to be enlightened. The storm gathered, and the waters rose. Three great waves impelled the living tide against the tottering house founded on the desert sand. The Arabs suffered acutely from poverty, misgovernment, and oppression. Infuriated, he looked up and perceived that the cause of all his miseries was a weak and cowardly foreigner, a despicable Turk. The antagonism of races increased the hatred sprung from social evils. The moment was at hand. Then, and not till then, the third wave came, the wave of fanaticism, which, catching up and surmounting the other waves, covered all the flood with its white foam, and, bearing on with the momentum of the waters, beat in thunder against the weak house so that it fell, and great was the fall thereof. Down to the year 1881 there was no fanatical movement in the Sudan. In their utter misery the hopeless inhabitants had neglected even the practices of religion. They were nevertheless prepared for any enterprise, however desperate, which might free them from the Egyptian yoke. All that delayed them was the want of some leader who could combine the tribes and restore their broken spirits, and in the summer of 1881 the leader appeared. His subsequent career is within the limits of this account, and since his life throws a strong light on the thoughts and habits of the Arabs of the Sudan, it may be worthwhile to trace it from the beginning. The man who was the proximate cause of the river war was born by the banks of the Nile not very far from Dongola. His family were poor, and of no account in the province. But as the prophet had claimed a royal descent, and as a sacred example was sprung from David's line, Mohammed Ahmed asserted that he was of the Ashraf, descendants of the prophet. And the assertion, since it cannot be disproved, may be accepted. His father was a humble priest, yet he contrived to give his son some education in the practices of religion, the principles of the Koran, and the art of writing. Then he died at Kareri while on a journey to Khartoum, and left the future Mahdi, still a child, to the mercies of the world. Solitary trees, if they grow at all, grow strong, and a boy deprived of a father's care often develops, if he escape the perils of youth, an independence and vigor of thought which may restore in afterlife the heavy loss of early days. It was so with Mohammed Ahmed. He looked around for an occupation and subsistence. A large proportion of the population of religious countries passed their lives at leisure, supported by the patient labor of the devout. The young man determined to follow the profession for which he felt his talents suited, and which would afford him the widest scope. He became a priest. Many of the religious teachers of heathen and other countries are devoid of enthusiasm and turn their attention to the next world, 
because doing so affords them an easy living in this. Happily, this is not true of all. It was not true of Mohammed. Even at an early age, he manifested a zeal for God's service, and displayed a peculiar aptitude for learning the tenets and dogmas of the Mohammedan belief. So promising a pupil did not long lack a master in a country where intelligence and enthusiasm were scarce. His aspirations growing with his years and knowledge, he journeyed to Khartoum as soon as his religious education was completed, and became a disciple of the renowned and holy sheikh, Mohammed Sharif. His devotion to his superior, to his studies, and to the practice of austerities, and a strange personal influence he was already beginning to show, won him by degrees a few disciples of his own, and with them he retired to the island of Abba. Here by the waters of the White Nile, Mohammed Ahmed lived for several years. His two brothers, who were boat builders in the neighborhood, supported him by their industry. But it must have been an easy burden, for we read that he hollowed out for himself a cave in the mud bank and lived in almost entire seclusion, fasting often for days, and occasionally paying a visit to the head of the order to assure him of his devotion and obedience. I take this passage from Fire and Sword in the Sudan, by Slatin. His account is the most graphic and trustworthy of all known records of the Mahdi. He had terrible opportunities of collecting information. I have followed his version, chapter 4, very closely on this subject. Meanwhile, his sanctity increased, and the labor and charity of the brothers were assisted by the alms of godly travelers on the river. This virtuous and frugal existence was disturbed and terminated by an untoward event. The renowned and holy sheikh made a feast to celebrate the circumcision of his sons. That the merriment of the auspicious occasion and the entertainment of the guests might be increased, Sharif, according to the lax practice of the time, granted a dispensation from any sins committed during the festivities, and proclaimed in God's name the suspension of the rules against singing and dancing by which the religious orders were bound. The ascetic of Abba Island did not join in these seemingly innocent dissipations. With the recklessness of the reformer he protested against the demoralization of the age, and loudly affirmed the doctrine that God alone could forgive sins. These things were speedily brought to the ears of the renowned sheikh, and in all the righteous indignation that accompanies detected wrongdoing, he summoned Mohammed Ahmed before him. The latter obeyed. He respected his superior. He was under obligations to him. His ire had disappeared as soon as it had been expressed. He submissively entreated forgiveness, but in vain. Sharif felt that some sort of discipline must be maintained among his flock. He had connived at disobedience to the divine law. All the more must he uphold his own authority. Rising in anger, he drove the presumptuous disciple from his presence with bitter words, and expunged his name from the order of the elect. Mohammed went home. He was greatly distressed. Yet his fortunes were not ruined. His sanctity was still a valuable and, unless he chose otherwise, an inalienable asset. The renowned sheikh had a rival nearly as holy and more enterprising than himself. From him the young priest might expect a warm welcome. Nevertheless, he did not abandon his former superior. Placing a heavy wooden collar on his neck, clad in sackcloth and sprinkled with ashes, he again returned to his spiritual leader, and in this penitential guise implored pardon. He was ignominiously ejected. Nor did he venture to revisit the unforgiving sheikh. But it happened that in a few weeks, Sharif had occasion to journey to the island of Abba. His former disciple appeared suddenly before him, still clad in sackcloth and defiled by ashes. Careless of his plain misery, and unmoved by his loyalty, which was the more remarkable since it was disinterested, the implacable sheikh poured forth a stream of invective. Among many insults, one went home. Be off, you wretched Dongolawi! Although the natives of the Dongola province were despised and disliked in the southern Sudan, it is not at first apparent why Mohammed should have resented so bitterly the allusion to his birthplace. 
but abuse by class is a dangerous though effective practice. A man will perhaps tolerate an offensive word applied to himself, but will be infuriated if his nation, his rank, or his profession is insulted. Mohammed Ahmed rose. All that man could do to make amends he had done. Now he had been publicly called a wretched Dongolawi. Henceforth he would afflict Sharif with his repentance no longer. Reaching his house, he informed his disciples, for they had not abandoned him in all his trouble, that the sheikh had finally cast him off, and that he would now take his discarded allegiance elsewhere. The rival, the sheikh el Qurayshi, lived near Mesalamia. He was jealous of Sharif and envied him his sanctimonious disciples. He was therefore delighted to receive a letter from Mohammed Ahmed announcing his breach with his former superior and offering his most devoted services. He received a cordial invitation, and the priest of Abba Island made all preparation for the journey. This new development seemed to have startled the unforgiving Sharif. It was no part of his policy to alienate his followers, still less to add to those of his rival. After all, the quality of mercy was high and noble. He would at last graciously forgive the impulsive but repentant disciple. He wrote him a letter to this effect. But it was now too late. Mohammed replied with grave dignity that he had committed no crime, that he sought no forgiveness, and that a wretched Dongolawi would not offend by his presence the renowned Sheikh El Sharif. After this indulgence he departed to Mesalamia. But the fame of his doings spread far and wide throughout the land. Even in distant Darfur it was the principal topic of conversation, says Slatin in Fire and Sword. Rarely had a Fiki been known to offend his superior, never to refuse his forgiveness. Mohammed did not hesitate to declare that he had done what he had done as a protest against the decay of religious fervor and the torpor of the times. Since his conduct had actually caused his dismissal, it appears that he was quite justified in making a virtue of necessity. At any rate, he was believed, and the people groaning under oppression looked from all the regions to the figure that began to grow on the political horizon. His fame grew. Rumor, loud-tongued, carried it about the land that a great reformer was come to purify the faith and break the stony apathy which paralyzed the hearts of Islam. Whisperings added that a man was found who should break from off the necks of the tribes the hateful yoke of Egypt. Mohammed now deliberately entered upon the path of ambition. Throughout Nubia, the Shukri belief prevails. Some day, in a time of shame and trouble, a second great prophet will arise, a Mahdi, who shall lead the faithful nearer God and sustain the religion. The people of the Sudan always look inquiringly to any ascetic who rises to fame, and the question is often repeated, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Of this powerful element of disturbance, Muhammad Ahmed resolved to avail himself. He requested and obtained the permission of the Sheikh Qurayshi to return to Abba, where he was well known, and with which island village his name was connected, and so came back in triumph to the scene of his disgrace. Thither many pilgrims began to resort. He received valuable presents, which he distributed to the poor, who acclaimed him as Zahed, a renouncer of earthly pleasures. He journeyed preaching through Kordofan, and received the respect of the priesthood and the homage of the people. And while he spoke of the purification of the religion, they thought that the burning words might be applied to the freedom of the soil. He supported his sermons by writings, which were widely read. When a few months later the Sheikh Qureshi died, the priest of Abba proceeded forthwith to erect a tomb to his memory, directing and controlling the voluntary labors of the reverent Arabs who carried the stones. While Mohammed was thus occupied, he received the support of a man, less virtuous than, but nearly as famous as himself. Abdullah was one of four brothers, the sons of an obscure priest, but he inherited no great love of religion or devotion to its observances. He was a man of determination and capacity. He set before himself two distinct ambitions, both of which he accomplished, to free the Sudan of foreigners 
and to rule it himself. He seems to have had a queer presentiment of his career. This much he knew. There would be a great religious leader, and he would be his lieutenant and his successor. When Zubair conquered Darfur, Abdullah presented himself before him, and hailed him as the expected Mahdi. Zubair, however, protested with superfluous energy that he was no saint, and the impulsive patriot was compelled to accept his assurances. So soon as he saw Mohammed Ahmed rising to fame, and displaying qualities of courage and energy, he hastened to throw himself at his feet, and assure him of his devotion. No part of Slatin Pasha's fascinating account of his perils and sufferings is so entertaining as that in which Abdullah, then become Khalifa of the whole Sudan, describes his early struggles and adversity. Indeed, it was a very troublesome journey. At that time my entire property consisted of one donkey, and he had a gall on his back, so that I could not ride him. But I made him carry my water-skin and bag of corn, over which I spread my rough cotton garment, and drove him along in front of me. At that time I wore the white cotton shirt, like the rest of my tribe. My clothes and my dialect at once marked me out as a stranger wherever I went, and when I crossed the Nile I was frequently greeted with, What do you want? Go back to your own country. There is nothing to steal here. What a life of ups and downs! It was a long stride from the ownership of one saddle-galled donkey to the undisputed rule of an empire. The weary wayfarer may have dreamed of this, for ambition stirs imagination nearly as much as imagination excites ambition. But further he could not expect or wish to see. Nor could he anticipate as, in the complacency of a man who had done with evil days, he told the story of his rise to the submissive Slanton, that the day would come when he would lead an army of more than fifty thousand men to destruction, and that the night would follow when, almost alone, his empire shrunk again to the saddle-galled donkey, he would seek his home in distant Kordofan, while this same Slatin who knelt so humbly before him would lay the fierce pursuing squadrons on the trail. Mohammed Ahmed received his new adherent kindly, but without enthusiasm. For some months Abdullah carried stones to build the tomb of the Sheikh el Qureshi. Gradually they got to know each other. But long before he entrusted me with his secret, said Abdullah to Slatin, I knew that he was the expected guide. From Slatin, Fire and Sword, page 131. And though the world might think that the messenger of God was sent to lead men to happiness in heaven, Abdullah attached to the phrase a significance of his own, and knew that he should lead him to power on earth. The two formed a strong combination. The Mahdi, for such Muhammad Ahmed had already in secret announced himself, brought the wild enthusiasm of religion, the glamour of a stainless life, and the influence of superstition into the movement. But if he were the soul of the plot, Abdullah was the brain. He was the man of the world, the practical politician, the general. There now commenced a great conspiracy against the Egyptian government. It was fostered by the discontents and justified by the miseries of the people of the Sudan. The Mahdi began to collect adherents and to extend his influence to all parts of the country. He made a second journey through Kordofan, and received everywhere promises of support from all classes. The most distant tribes sent assurances of devotion and reverence, and, what was of more importance, of armed assistance. The secret could not be long confined to those who welcomed the movement. As the ramifications of the plot spread, they were perceived by the renowned Sheikh Sharif, who still nursed his chagrin and thirsted for revenge. He warned the Egyptian government. They, knowing his envy and hatred of his former disciple, discounted his evidence, and for some time paid no attention to the gathering of the storm. But presently more trustworthy witnesses confirmed his statements, and Rauf Pasha, then Governor-General, finding himself confronted with a growing agitation, determined to act. He accordingly sent a messenger to the island of Abba to summon Muhammad Ahmed to Khartoum to justify his behavior and explain his intentions. The news of the dispatch of the messenger was swiftly carried to the Mahdi. He consulted with his trusty lieutenant. 
they decided to risk everything, and without further delay to defy the government. When it is remembered how easily an organized army, even though it be in a bad condition, can stamp out the beginnings of revolt among a population, the courage of their resolve must be admired. The messenger arrived. He was received with courtesy by Abdullah, and forthwith conducted before the Mahdi. He delivered his message, and urged Muhammad Ahmed to comply with the orders of the Governor-General. The Mahdi listened for some time in silence, but with increasing emotion, and when the messenger advised him, as he valued his own safety, to journey to Khartoum, if only to justify himself, his passion overcame him. What? he shouted, rising suddenly and striking his breast with his hand. By the grace of God and his prophet, I am master of this country, and never shall I go to Khartoum to justify myself. From Slatin, Fire and Sword, page 135. The terrified messenger withdrew. The rebellion of the Mahdi had begun. Both the priest and the governor-general prepared for military enterprise. The Mahdi proclaimed a holy war against the foreigners, alike the enemies of God and the scourge of men. He collected his followers. He roused the local tribes. He wrote letters to all parts of the Sudan, calling upon the people to fight for a purified religion, the freedom of the soil, and God's holy prophet, the expected Mahdi. He promised the honor of men to those who lived, the favor of God to those who fell, and lastly that the land should be cleared of the miserable Turk. Better, he said, and it became the watchword of the revolt, thousands of graves than a dollar tax. From Orwalder, ten years' captivity in the Mahdi's camp. Nor was Rauf Pasha idle. He sent two companies of infantry with one gun by steamer to Abba to arrest the fanatic who disturbed the public peace. What followed is characteristically Egyptian. Each company was commanded by a captain. To encourage their efforts, whichever officer captured the Mahdi was promised promotion. At sunset, on an August evening in 1881, the steamer arrived at Abba. The promise of the Governor-General had provoked the strife, not the emulation of the officers. Both landed with their companies and proceeded by different routes under the cover of darkness to the village where the Mahdi dwelt. Arriving simultaneously from opposite directions, they fired into each other, and in the midst of this mistaken combat, the Mahdi rushed upon them with his scanty following and destroyed them impartially. A few soldiers succeeded in reaching the bank of the river, but the captain of the steamer would run no risks, and those who could not swim out to the vessel were left to their fate. With such tidings the expedition returned to Khartoum. Mohammed Ahmed had been himself wounded in the attack, but the faithful Abdullah bound up the injury so that none might know that God's prophet had been pierced by carnal weapons. The effect of this success was electrical. The news spread throughout the Sudan. Men with sticks had slain men with rifles. A priest had destroyed the soldiers of the government. Surely this was the expected one. The Mahdi, however, profited by his victory only to accomplish a retreat without loss of prestige. Abdullah had no illusions. More troops would be sent. They were too near to Khartoum. Prudence counseled flight to regions more remote. But before this new Hijira, the Mahdi appointed his four caliphs, in accordance with prophecy and precedent. The first was Abdullah. Of the others, it is only necessary at this moment to notice Ali Wad Helu, the chief of one of the local tribes, and among the first to rally to the standard of revolt. Then the retreat began, but it was more like a triumphal progress, attended by a considerable following, and preceded by tales of the most wonderful miracles and prodigies. The Mahdi retired to a mountain in Kordofan, to which he gave the name of Jebel Masa, that being the mountain whence the expected guide is declared in the Koran sooner or later to appear. He was now out of reach of Khartoum, but within reach of Fashoda. The Egyptian governor of that town, Rashid Bey, a man of more enterprise and even less military knowledge than is usual in his race, determined to make all attempt to seize the rebel and disperse his following. Taking no precautions, he fell on the 9th of December into an ambush, was attacked unprepared, 
and was himself with fourteen hundred men slaughtered by the ill-armed but valiant Arabs. The whole country stirred. The government, thoroughly alarmed by the serious aspect the revolt had assumed, organized a great expedition. Four thousand troops under Yusef, a pasha of distinguished reputation, were sent against the rebels. Meanwhile, the Mahdi and his followers suffered the extremes of want. Their cause was as yet too perilous for the rich to join. Only the poor flocked to the holy standard. All that Mohammed possessed he gave away, keeping nothing for himself, excepting only a horse to lead his followers in battle. Abdullah walked. Nevertheless, the rebels were half famished, and armed with scarcely any more deadly weapons than sticks and stones. The army of the government approached slowly. Their leaders anticipated an easy victory. Their contempt for the enemy was supreme. They did not even trouble themselves to post sentries by night, but slept calmly inside a slender thorn fence, unwatched save by their tireless foes. And so it came to pass that in the half-light of the early morning of the 7th of June, the Mahdi, his ragged Khalifas, and his almost naked army rushed upon them and slew them to a man. The victory was decisive. Southern Kordofan was at the feet of the priest of Abba, Stores of arms and ammunition had fallen into his hands. Thousands of every class hastened to join his standard. No one doubted that he was the divine messenger sent to free them from their oppressors. The whole of the Arab tribes all over the Sudan rose at once. The revolt broke out simultaneously in Senar and Darfur, and spread to provinces still more remote. The smaller Egyptian posts, the tax-gatherers and local administrators, were massacred in every district. Only the larger garrisons maintained themselves in the principal towns. They were at once blockaded. All communications were interrupted. All legal authority was defied. Only the Mahdi was obeyed. It is now necessary to look for a moment to Egypt. The misgovernment which in the Sudan had caused the rebellion of the Mahdi, in Egypt produced the revolt of Arabi Pasha, as the people of the Sudan longed to be rid of the foreign oppressors, the so-called Turks, so those of the Delta were eager to free themselves from the foreign regulators and the real Turkish influence. While men who lived by the sources of the Nile asserted that tribes did not exist for officials to harry, others who dwelled at its mouth protested that nations were not made to be exploited by creditors or aliens. The ignorant South found their leader in a priest, the more educated north looked to a soldier. Mohammed Ahmed broke the Egyptian yoke. Arabi gave expression to the hatred of the Egyptians for the Turks. But although the hardy Arabs might scatter the effete Egyptians, the effete Egyptians were not likely to disturb the solid battalions of Europe. After much hesitation and many attempts at compromise, the liberal administration of Mr. Gladstone sent a fleet which reduced the forts of Alexandria to silence and the city to anarchy. The bombardment of the fleet was followed by the invasion of a powerful army. 25,000 men were landed in Egypt. The campaign was conducted with celerity and skill. The Egyptian armies were slaughtered or captured. Their patriotic but commonplace leader was sentenced to death and condemned to exile, and Great Britain assumed the direction of Egyptian affairs. The British soon restored law and order in Egypt, and the question of the revolt in the Sudan came before the English advisers of the Khedive. Notwithstanding the poverty and military misfortunes which depressed the people of the Delta, the desire to hold their southern provinces was evident. The British government, which at that time was determined to pursue a policy of non-interference in the Sudan, gave a tacit consent, and another great expedition was prepared to suppress the false prophet, as the English and Egyptian deemed him, the expected Mahdi, as the people of the Sudan believed. A retired officer of the Indian Staff Corps and a few European officers of various nationalities were sent to Khartoum to organize the new field force. Meanwhile, the Mahdi, having failed to take by storm, laid siege to El Obeid, the chief town of Kordofan. 
During the summer of 1883, the Egyptian troops gradually concentrated at Khartoum until a considerable army was formed. It was perhaps the worst army that has ever marched to war. One extract from General Hicks's letters will suffice. Writing on the 8th of June, 1883, to Sir E. Wood, he says, incidentally, Fifty-one men of the Krupp battery deserted on the way here, although in chains. The officers and men who had been defeated fighting for their own liberties at Tel El Kabir were sent to be destroyed, fighting to take away the liberties of others in the Sudan. They had no spirit, no discipline, hardly any training, and in a force of over 8,000 men there were scarcely a dozen capable officers. The two who were the most notable of these few, General Hicks, who commanded, and Colonel Farquhar, the chief of the staff, must be remarked. El Obeid had fallen before the ill-fated expedition left Khartoum, but the fact that Slatin Bey, an Austrian officer in the Egyptian service, was still maintaining himself in Darfur, provided it with an object. On the 9th of September, Hicks and his army, the actual strength of which was 7,000 infantry, 400 mounted Bashi Bazuks, 500 cavalry, 100 Circassians, 10 mounted guns, 4 Krupps, and 6 Nordenfeldt machine guns, left Omdurman and marched to Duem. Although the actual command of the expedition was vested in the English officer, Allah el-Din Pasha, the governor-general who had succeeded Rauf Pasha, exercised an uncertain authority. Differences of opinion were frequent, though all the officers were agreed in taking the darkest views of their chances. The miserable host toiled slowly onward towards its destruction, marching in a southwesterly direction through Shat and Rahad. Here the condition of the force was so obviously demoralized that a German servant, Gustav Klutz, the servant of Baron Seckendorf, actually deserted to the Mahdi's camp. He was paraded in triumph as an English officer. On the approach of the government troops, the Mahdi had marched out of Obayid and established himself in the open country, where he made his followers live under military conditions and continually practiced them in warlike evolutions. More than 40,000 men collected round his standard, and the Arabs were now armed with several thousand rifles and a few cannon, as well as a great number of swords and spears. To these proportions had the little band of followers who fought at Abba grown. The disparity of the forces was apparent before the battle. The Mahdi thereupon wrote to Hicks, calling on him to surrender and offering terms. His proposals were treated with disdain, although the probable result of an engagement was clear. Until the expedition reached Rahad, only a few cavalry patrols had watched its slow advance. But on the 1st of November, the Mahdi left Obayid and marched with his whole power to meet his adversary. The collision took place on the 3rd of November. All through that day the Egyptians struggled slowly forward, in great want of water, losing continually from the fire of the Sudanese riflemen, and leaving several guns behind them. On the next morning they were confronted by the main body of the Arab army, and their attempts to advance further were defeated with heavy loss. The force began to break up. Yet another day was consumed before it was completely destroyed. Scarcely 500 Egyptians escaped death. Hardly as many of the Arabs fell. The European officers perished fighting to the end, and the general met his fate sword in hand at the head of the last formed body of his troops, his personal valor and physical strength exciting the admiration even of the fearless enemy, so that in chivalrous respect they buried his body with barbaric honors. Mohammed Ahmed celebrated his victory with a salute of 100 guns, and well he might, for the Sudan was now his, and his boast that, by God's grace and the favor of the Prophet, he was the master of all the land, had been made good by force of arms. No further attempt was made to subdue the country. The people of the Sudan had won their freedom by their valor and by the skill and courage of their saintly leader. It only remained to evacuate the towns and withdraw the garrisons safely. But what looked like the winding up of one story was really the beginning of another, much longer, just as bloody, commencing in shame and disaster, 
but ending in triumph and, let us hope, in peace. I desire for a moment to take a more general view of the Mahdi's movement than the narrative has allowed. The original causes were social and racial, but, great as was the misery of the people, their spirit was low, and they would not have taken up arms merely on material grounds. Then came the Mahdi. He gave the tribes the enthusiasm they lacked. The war broke out. It is customary to lay to the charge of Mohammed Ahmed all the blood that was spilled. To my mind, it seems that he may divide the responsibility with the unjust rulers who oppressed the land, with the incapable commanders who muddled away the lives of their men, with the vacillating ministers who aggravated the misfortunes. But, whatever is sent to the Mahdi's account, it should not be forgotten that he put life and soul into the hearts of his countrymen, and freed his native land of foreigners. The poor, miserable natives, eating only a handful of grain, toiling half-naked and without hope, found a new, if terrible, magnificence added to life. Within their humble breasts, the spirit of the Mahdi roused the fires of patriotism and religion. Life became filled with thrilling, exhilarating terrors. They existed in a new and wonderful world of imagination. While they lived there were great things to be done, and when they died, whether it was slaying the Egyptians or charging the British squares, a paradise which they could understand awaited them. There are many Christians who reverence the faith of Islam, and yet regard the Mahdi merely as a commonplace religious impostor whom force of circumstances elevated to notoriety. In a certain sense this may be true, but I know not how a genuine may be distinguished from a spurious prophet except by the measure of his success. The triumphs of the Mahdi were in his lifetime far greater than those of the founder of the Mohammedan faith, and the chief difference between orthodox Mohammedanism and Mahdism was that the original impulse was opposed only by decaying systems of government and society, and the recent movement came in contact with civilization and the machinery of science. Recognizing this, I do not share the popular opinion, and I believe that if in future years prosperity should come to the peoples of the Upper Nile, and learning and happiness follow in its train, then the first Arab historian who shall investigate the early annals of that new nation will not forget, foremost among the heroes of his race, to write the name of Muhammad Ahmed. End of chapter 1